Now that we know everything we need to know about XML, let's get started on the XSL example. But first, we need to create an XML file to work with. As before, we start the XML file with the XML tag that tells the parser that it is an XML file, which version it is, and which encoding it's using. But when using XSL, the system needs to know about two files. The file that contains your XML information, that we call a PCF file, and then the file that contains the XSL code. When previewing or publishing such a file, you only point at one, the PCF file. So we need a way to specify to OU Campus which XSL file will be used to render your XML information. To do so, we have to add one more tag to the prologue of the XML file, which will direct OU Campus to the XSL file to use. Such a tag is called a processing instruction. And this specific processing instruction is what we call a PCF style sheet. Within it, we're going to specify a couple of pseudo attributes that tell OU Campus where to find the XSL file. The first one is the path to that file. And the second one is the extension that we're going to use when publishing to the production server. The problem is that when you're publishing a file, you're selecting a .pcf file. This is not something you want on your production server. You want some other extension. This is where you would specify that. In this case, we're going to use HTML. So that's it for the prologue. The system now knows which XSL file to use to render the XML information. Let's put in a comment, which is a good habit to have. And then we need our document element, which will contain everything else. Um, we could name it anything we want, since what we're going to store is a document. A good name is document. And that's it. We now have a valid XML file. It really doesn't contain anything useful, but it does have the starting structure, which will allow us to get the XSL project started. Let's save it. This is normal, since the XSL does not contain any code yet. XSL is itself an XML format. So we're going to start the XSL file the same way we started the XML file, with the XML marker, which I conveniently copied from the other file. The very first thing we need to put in our XSL file is our document element, the element that's going to contain everything else. In this case, XSL is a format that was given to us, just like HTML. So we're not free to create all the tags that we want. We have to follow the actual XSL syntax. So the document element is a very specific element that we need to type in. And this element is called XSL style sheet. This is our document element for the whole file. And we're going to put a lot of stuff in there, so I might as well start it right. You're probably wondering why this tag starts with the word XSL followed by a colon. The problem is that when you're dealing with specific formats encoded using XML, it's possible to want to have multiple sets of tags in the same file. And it's also possible that some of those tags may have the same name, which would confuse the issue. Therefore, a process was invented in the XML format for extending the naming of the tags. Think of it as the names you've been giving your tags so far in all the previous examples have been these tags first name. So what we're adding to it is the ability to provide a last name to those tags so that even if multiple tags share the same first name, if they have a different last name, there is no confusion as to which is which. This is exactly what I'm doing here. XSL is really the last name of the tag, and style sheet is the first name, equivalent name as in the previous examples. These last names are actually defined within the document itself, and that's what we're going to do next. We're going to add several attributes to our document element that the XSL engine needs to know how to go about parsing this file. The very first thing we need to put in is the version number of the XSL language we're going to be using. And we're going to be using 
version 2.0 of XSL for the purpose of this example. The next thing is where we define the last name that we're using in this, this document, specifically XSL. XSL itself is an alias. The last name is a full URI, which would be very inconvenient. So this is why we dis, uh, define a specific alias for a last name in the document element, which we can then use from then on. This is done by declaring what's called a namespace. XML namespace, colon, the alias we intend to use, in this case, XSL equals, and then between quotes, the actual last name of those tags, which is a full URI. This is how we've mapped the XSL alias to the actual last name used by the XSL language. And from here on end, we can use XSL as the last name of all our tags that, have, that refer to the XSL language. We will be able to have other tags uh, within the file, but those will use a different last name or no last name at all. The next thing we're going to add is another namespace that we're going to need to declare variable types. And this one is XML namespace. The alias is XS, and the actual URI is HTTP. Now that we've defined our two aliases, there's one more thing that we need to do. In some cases, the XSL engine will actually copy these uh, namespace definitions into the output, which is something we don't really want to do. So we're going to add one more attribute to tell it not to do that. And here, I would put in a space separated list of all the aliases we don't want to include. By default, the XSL alias will never be included. This is the one that represents the language itself. So I only need to list XS. The next thing we need to do is state various settings to the XSL engine about what we intend to do in this program. This is done through the use of an XSL tag called output. The first thing we need to declare is the method, or in other words, what kind of output document we intend to generate. There are many things that XSL can generate. You can generate a text file, another XML file, an HTML file, pretty much anything you can think of. In this case, we intend to generate an HTML document. And in fact, since we've declared it as an HTML document, it's also nice to include the version of HTML we intend to use, in this case, 401. For version 5, the rules are a little different. Next, do we want the output to be just one straight line, which is the most efficient, or do we want to format it in some way that is readable by humans? This is what we want since we intend to debug it. So we intend to indent. And finally, as discussed before, everything we do uses the UTF-8 encoding. Since we're using HTML 401, we want to include a doc type at the beginning of the output. So we need to tell the XSL engine to do that as well. This too is done through the XSL output tag. And we need to specify doc type public equals. And this part I'm sure you'll recognize. And then we need to specify the second part of the doc type. I wanted to go over each and every single one of these statements so that you have an idea of what these various pieces are for. There are many other pieces that can be added or changed, but in general, you'll come up with a header that works for you, this document element in all its attributes, and you'll simply copy it from one file to another. You'll never have to really recreate this. You just need to know it exists, what it's for, but simply copy paste it in your new XSL documents in the future. Now that we have a starting point, we need to start processing the XML file. How does this work? This is a programming language that works very differently from the programming languages you're probably used to. Um, you don't define procedures. This is more like a very complex regex. You define patterns that you're going to match, and when they match, they trigger uh, some code 
to be executed. Um, in this case, the only thing we have so far is our document element in the PCF file. Uh, and that document element is actually named document. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a template that's going to match that document element. And then this will trigger the execution of the code within that, within that template after it finds it in the PCF file. How do we do that? Again, we create an XSL tag called template. We then provide an X path to match. And I'll get back to that. And then we have our template. Now, what's an X path? The next path is basically a path within your XML file. You start at the very beginning of the file, and that's represented by the slash at the very beginning here. And then at the top, you specify the element to look for. In this case, we're looking for the document element. And then if you wanted to go deeper, which we don't have yet, you would just keep going down this path. And this ultimately addresses a specific element within your XML file, traversing it just like you traverse folders on a hard drive. So in this case, I have told it to match our document element, named document, at the top of the file, at the root of the file. When the XSL engine encounters this template, it tries to find that element in the XML file that we referenced. If it finds it, it will then execute all the code that we put here inside our template. What would we do here? We would simply generate the output. How do we do that? We simply type it in. So if our intent is to generate an HTML document, let's just do that. And we start typing in the HTML structure that we intend to generate. And here it is, a very, very basic structure for our HTML document. So we've simply told the XSL engine to find the document element. And when it did, it simply started executing the code within the template, which generated this output. Let's add a little bit more to it. Let's see, let's add a title. And that's it. We now have a valid XSL document that we can try. So let's save it and then switch back to the PCF and preview it. The preview doesn't show anything, but that's because we didn't provide anything to show. Let's take a look at the source. And we have it here. We, in fact, have the output that we created, HTML, head, the title, the body, and close HTML. Now there's more stuff in here. First, this meta is auto-generated by the XSL engine this comes from the XSL output tags that we declared where we told it what we wanted to generate. And specifically, the fact that we wanted to use the encoding type UTF-8. When it sees that, it automatically inserts this meta in the output, making sure that the browser understands that's what we used. Then there's this second tag. And this is something that was inserted after the fact by the OU Campus system to make the preview work. When you publish a file, this won't be present. So you can simply ignore it. Everything worked perfectly. So let's go back to our code. What is the next thing that we would want to do? For example, instead of hard coding the title in our code, it would be nice if we actually acquired that title from the PCF itself. So let's go do that. We're back to the PCF file. Let's now open up that document element and put things in it. Well, in this specific case, we want, let's say, a title. So let's create a tag called title. It doesn't have to be called title, but in this case, it makes sense. And we're going to put our title in it. And let's call it example document. OK, let's save this. Let's go back to the code. And now, instead of hard coding our title, we're going to acquire it from the PCF document. How do we do that? Here's a new tag called XSL value of that will allow us to access a piece of information in the PCF file. 
And in the select statement, again, we specify a piece of XPath that tells us how to find it. So we specify slash document, then slash title. And this points at the title element we just added. Value of will go and acquire the data from that element and then will replace itself with that data in the output. So let's take a look at that. And again, we don't see anything. So let's take a look at the source. And we can see that the title is no longer that hard-coded version, but it is in fact the information that we found in the PCF. So this is how we can acquire information from our XML file. Let's take it a little bit further. Let's go back to the code. We don't really have to specify the entire path from the top of the document down to the element that we're trying to read. In the template definition, we stated where the element that we were looking for was slash document. When we did that, the XSL engine remembered this specific element that we were trying to match as the current element. So any XPath that we use from within this template can be a relative uh, path from that specific element. The advantage is that in the future, we will be using templates that match multiple things. So by using the currently defined element, we can apply our code to multiple different elements that we found through the file, namely lists of things. So in this case, how we would do that, we specify a relative path instead of an absolute path, assuming that the current element is document, and that allows us to do it this way. Simply specify title, and this means find the title element within the document element that we're currently pointing at. So let's try this. Let's take a look at the source. And as you can see, it did find the title again. So this is the way that we will do things from now on. We will use relative uh, XPath within each template. The next piece of information we might want in this file and this is just an example. This isn't meant to be representative of the way you would normally build an HTML file. But as an example, we can actually generate CSS information in the output that we acquired from the PCF file. For that purpose, we'll just create a CSS tag and then we'll put in some CSS text as data within it. And there we go. Now that we have that information, let's go and modify the code to make use of it. Let's save. Let's go back to the code. So right here inside the head element, we're going to add a style section uh, that will contain the CSS that we just defined in the PCF. How do we acquire the CSS information? Our friend XSL value of. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the CSS element within the document element. Let's remember that the document element is the current element, so we can reference that piece directly using a relative XPath. One last thing that we need is to declare a type. Okay, let's see if this works. And there you have it. After the title within the head, we have declared a style element, which itself contains all the CSS information we acquired from the PCF file. And we end it here and then we end the head. So this worked perfectly.
As an example, we can take this a little bit further. What if we didn't want to hard code the type, but we wanted to supply it from the page? Again, this is not a typical example of how you would create an HTML page. It's just showing you what uh, certain things you can do are. Let's go back to the PCF file. And here, as part of the CSS element, I'm going to declare the type that we had in the code. Let's save this. Let's go back to the code. Now that we're back in the source, we are trying to acquire this type from the attribute of the CSS element. How do we do that? Well, there are several problems we need to address. First, typically, so far, when we've been wanting to access a piece of information from the PCF file, we've used XSL value of. We can't do that. The problem is if I simply have a tag within it that, let's say, would access the specific X path that we're looking for, the problem is that we have a tag within a tag. And that is not something that is legal in XML. So we can't specify this. So let's backtrack a little bit. We need to come up with a different way of doing this. For this, XSL provides a special syntax. By specifying two curly braces, we are telling the XSL engine that we want to access some piece of information from the XML file and insert it as a replacement to whatever the curly braces represent in, in this specific case. Now, within those curly braces, we simply specify an X path. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the CSS element, and we're looking for its type attribute within it. This isn't going to work. Why? Because this would look for a type element within the CSS element. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for an attribute. To do that, you start with an add character. And this piece of X path actually says, within the document element, look for a CSS element, and then within that CSS element, look for an attribute named type. And then return that information and replace this entire section with that information. So this will indeed acquire the text slash CSS from the PCF and inject it here. Let's try it. Let's take a look at the code. And the output hasn't changed. We still have our style type equals text slash CSS, which was acquired from the PCF file from an actual piece of metadata. So now we've just learned two more very important things. A new way of accessing information that doesn't use XSL value of. You use XSL value of when you're trying to acquire a piece of data to inject. Or I should say, when you're trying to inject a piece of data within an element, an output element. But when you're trying to acquire a piece of information from the PCF file and you're trying to inject it as a piece of metadata in the output, you use a new syntax called curly curly, which itself contains an X path that points to that information. That's the first thing we've learned. The second thing we've learned is how to access an attribute instead of accessing a sub-element. And you do this by preceding the type of that attribute with an at character. This is not the only way to add CSS information. We could also inject CSS information directly from the code and hard code it. And we're going to add a few more that I'm going to need later. Now that we have this, let's check out the output and we'll see that we're combining information that is hard coded in the code and information that was retrieved from the PCF. And here we go. We can see that we have our style tag that starts and ends here. 
that begins with the information that we retrieved from the PCF plus the information that we injected from the XSL style sheet. So it's possible to combine information as well. And again, we're acquiring the type from the PCF as well. If we were to do these things in place within the template and do everything we're going to do about this specific HTML page in line within the document template, the code within this template would very quickly become very complex. So what we can do is actually delegate a subpart of what we're trying to do to another template. How do we do that? First, we define a template for what it is that we want to do. And what we're going to try to do with this template is to do everything that has to do with the style tag. Everything we did here in line, we're going to make a template to handle that. So what we're looking for really is the CSS tag within the PCF file. We're going to trigger on that. And if we find one, we're going to output all this stuff to the HTML file. So what we're going to try uh, to find in the file is the CSS tag. And we'll see later how we trigger that. And then within this template, we're going to do everything we were doing here. But things will be a little bit different. Let me copy it. Here we go. Now we have a template that will look for the CSS tag and then trigger the output of everything we do with it. But remember, as I explained before, when we were in the document template, the current element was the document element. In this template, the current element will be the CSS element. So we no longer need to look for it. So the simplification here is that we can reference the type attribute directly and here we can reference the current element. And to reference the current element, there's a simplified syntax to do that. You simply use a period, and that means the data of the current element that the template is focusing on. Now that we have created the template to handle the CSS tag, we can replace the inline code with a special tag that tells the XSL engine to go and look for a CSS element and then use whatever template is defined to handle it. And this is XSL apply templates. And in it, we tell it what to look for. The current element is document, so we're simply looking for the CSS element within document. And then we no longer need all of this. So now the document template is a lot simpler. We're still creating our structure, sending out the title. Here the code is pretty simple, so we can leave it as such. But to handle the CSS element, if present, we delegate all that to a separate template that we have defined here. When the XSL engine encounters this statement, it looks for the CSS element in the PCF file. If it doesn't find it, it doesn't do anything. It simply moves on and finishes the, this template. But if it does find one CSS element, then it looks for a template that matches it and executes it. And in fact, if it were to find more than one, it would call the template on each one in turn. And this is how we will process lists in the future. So let's try this, and we should get the exact same result. And here we go, the exact same result as before. We have the style element, which contains the type that we get from the PCF, followed by the CSS information from the PCF, followed by the hard-coded CSS information. So everything still works perfectly. But now we've learned that we can actually subdivide the various uh, templates to keep the code clear and easy to understand and easy to maintain. Because everything that has to do with the CSS element and everything it contains is actually handled by this one template that we simply call in the main template. Using this, we can do a lot more. Our goal is to create a typical page 
as we would have on the front page of a website. So we need to add more information in the PCF. We already have the title that we want to use. We have the CSS that we want to use. Three more things that we're going to be using are a banner, a navigation area, and then of course a content area. We're just going to create tags for all these things. And then let's put some information uh, in the various pieces. What we're going to do here in order to allow the use of the WYSIWYG editor on the various pieces is we're going to actually have HTML code within these sections. So within the banner, we're going to have a piece of HTML. In this case, I'm going to use an H1 tag and just some text. Navigation, same thing. This is where you would have your navigation menus. And I'm going to just put in a simple placeholder. And then finally, the content area, which we'll define later. Let's save this. And now we need to write the code to handle these things. We're going to use the same principle as before. We're going to delegate processing of each of those pieces to their specific templates. So in the body, all we really need to do is to call the appropriate templates for each section in turn. First, we're going to want to create the banner. So we're looking for the banner tag in the PCF, then the navigation. We're looking for the navigation tag and then the content area. Now, of course, since we're looking for those tags, XSL needs to have templates to know what to do with these things. We're going to define the various templates for these pieces of information. Here's one. And now we have all three templates that we need. And we need to now include the code that will actually do the rendering for those various things. As before, since we need to go and acquire a piece of information, we can use value of. And what we're looking for here, since we are already in the banner, is simply the current element. And I can do that on the next one. And I'm not going to do anything for content yet since we didn't have any content there. So let's try this. And by the way, this is not going to work. The problem is that all it did was copy the text. None of the HTML was copied. So that H1 tag in the banner area, that H5 tag in the navigation area, and so forth, none of it was, was copied to the output. It only copied the text. Why did that happen? Well, it's actually a feature of value of. When you make use of value of, you're only directing the XSL engine to acquire the data for a tag and ignore all sub tags. So it gathers all the data, no matter how deep, makes one long string out of it and outputs that. This is not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to acquire all the HTML code that is present within this banner. For this, there is another tag that we need to make use of called copy of, and itself requires a different kind of way to access the information, a built-in function called node. This will acquire the entire subtree of nodes that is stored within banner, and copy of will simply copy that subtree into the output. So now this should actually do what we intended to do. I'm going to change it here too. And this time we're getting a result that is closer to what we want. So if we look at the output, we can see now that the HTML was actually injected in the output. And within the body, we now have our banner area and then we have our navigation area. But this is still not 
making use of all the CSS that I've included. So let's adjust our templates a little bit and really create the output that we want. So let's go into Banner. And what we're going to do is create a div that has a reference to the appropriate CSS. And then we'll inject this inside the div. And I'll do the same thing for the other one. And now everything is the way it should be. And this looks more or less the way I want it. We have the banner area, which spans the whole top. Then we have the navigation area, which spans the left side. And then we have the content area, which we haven't dealt with yet here in the middle. Let's take a look at the source. And we have exactly that body. We have the first div with its CSS reference, which then includes all the HTML from the PCF. And then the same thing for the navigation area. So now let's deal with the content. But for that, we need to inject some content in our PCF. So what am I going to put in here? Well, let's do something a little bit more complicated for this one. Instead of just having a piece of HTML, we're going to have a list of various sections that we want to display in the page. And each section will have uh, slightly different information and pieces of information that will be used separately. So what would this look like? Well, we want sections, so let's create a section tag. Within that tag, we'll put the HTML that we want to display. So let me enter some sample information. And let's actually use the CSS that we have. And let's repeat this. So we now have the section information inside the content, and the section itself contains some HTML. So let's go write the code to acquire this. So we are at our content template. Just like before, we're going to create a div that represents the, the entire contents of the page. And then within it, remember that we want to process the section. We're going to create its own template to handle that, which will allow us to process multiple sections if there are any in the file. So apply templates. And then we need to declare a template for the section. And within it, we're going to write the code to render that section in the page. So now what's going to happen? Well, after matching the content element in the PCF, we will output a div with ID content. And then for each and every section that we find within that content, we're going to render it using the section template. And this is where relative XPath comes into play. So how do we do that? We're just going to create a div with no special marker. And within it, we're just going to inject the HTML that is found within the file. And that's done the same way as before. When I type this, I should have said XSL. And here we go. It renders this section. Of course, there's only one, so we only see one. So let's see what it will do with more than one. So here, I'm going to create another section simply by pasting another exactly like one within it. And we'll see that this gets automatically rendered by the template. Why is that? It's because here, 
we've told it to apply the template for each and every section element that is found within the file. So it's going to find two, and for each one, it's going to run the section template on it and render it. Of course, getting the exact same information is not that interesting, so let's add a little bit more to it that will show us that these are indeed different renderings. And let's add a title or a heading as an attribute to each of the section. So let's add a, a heading attribute and let's call it section A. And then on the other one, heading attribute equals section B. Now let's go to the code and actually make use of that information. So here is our section template. Within it, before we actually uh, inject the HTML from the PCF, we're going to output the title. And let's do it as an H3, and then value of, select, and then what we're looking for is the heading attribute. Let's remember that we're already in the section, so we can access the attribute directly, but to access an attribute, you have to start with an add character and then reference the attribute that we're looking for. Let's try this. And now we can see that these pieces of metadata that we got from the PCF get rendered along with the HTML that was provided. And this is done for as many sections as exist in the file. Let's take it a little bit farther and instead of processing the heading directly in line within the section template, let's give it its own template. So let's create a new template that we're going to match on an attribute. And this is the new thing here. Within it, we're going to do the same rendering that we just did. But since we already are at heading, all we need to reference is the current element. And then we're going to replace the inline code with simply an apply templates that searches for at headings. And we can remove the inline code. And now the heading itself has its own template where the code that is used to render it can be kept separate, and which makes things more uh, maintainable. And as we can see, the rendering is still exactly like before. Everything is where it should be. And this is everything I wanted to cover about how to use XSL to retrieve information from an XML file and use it to render a very basic HTML page. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thank you.